When we're young, we have an amazing, positive outlook about how great life is going to be. But somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Yes, hello there world. How are we all in Join Up Dots land? I hope you're good. I hope you're rocking and rolling because we've got a belter of a show for you today. I always say that, don't I? But it's true because I just know it's going to be a good one. Today, um, guest is a man who quite simply knows how to get things done. The master non-procrastinator, the king of batching, the prince of the 80-20 principle, and the lord of my favourite law too, probably Parkinson's law. He's the owner of the blood... Blood? Um, my teeth have gone funny. He's the owner of the blog and podcast Beyond the To-Do List and shows us all how we are wasting so much time doing stuff that quite simply will not push us on to doing the great stuff that we have to do. Yes, Facebook is fun, Twitter is useful, and YouTube is wildly entertaining, but none of them should be used when they do not have to be used. If they are keeping us away from what we should be doing, then stop it. But how do we do that? How do we beat the addiction that checking our emails 50 times a day seems to have on all of us? And how did he manage to walk boldly into an area that we all struggle with? Is he a recovering addict? Well, let's find out and not waste any more time. You see, I'm being productive here. It's my pleasure to bring onto the show to start joining up dots the one and only Mr. Eric Fisher. How are you, Eric? I am doing amazing. Thank you for that awesome intro. I've never thought of myself that way, but I guess I guess everything you said is true, so... It is, isn't it? You you must be. But everything I know about productivity is about batching, eighty twenty principle, and Parkinson's law. Now that's what I kind of do on a daily basis. But I'm sure you're going to take us in areas that we've never dreamt possible, and spin our heads around and make us vomit pea soup or whatever you're going to do. But it's going to be absolutely amazing to find out. So I'm going to cut right to the chase. First of all, as I always like to do, how do you remain so? productive when you've got family and kids and everything else that goes on in our life how many kids have you got i've got two i've got a a nine-year-old daughter and a soon-to-be three-year-old son and is your nine-year-old daughter like my nine-year-old daughter that does handstands constantly and cartwheels and bounces around the house constantly oh yeah definitely and in fact add roller skates to that and maybe a pogo stick or her bike yeah can She's you, all over the place. Can you pogo stick? Because I can't do that. I've tried. I just cannot, um, can't, can't do it at all. I can do maybe five, and then I'm done. That's about it. <laughs> what, what, what's the record? If, if we could push you on to do it, wow. we could do it live on air, couldn't we, Eric? Get you pogo sticking live Ooh. on air. And I bet, we could. We I bet could you've try never that. done that. No. I don't think anybody's done that, actually. That that would be unique. That would be a, that would be a Guinness Book of World Records. Most pogo stick uh, bounces on air of a podcast. So you could be a record uh, probably, holder. It could be, yeah. It, it could be 10 to 15, probably, at most. I'm, I mean, I'm sure if I practiced at it, I could get really good at it, like, like a lot of things that are, are fun but maybe not as important. But, uh, you know, I could, I could probably swing it. I could I could push that ten thousand hour rule on the on the uh, <laughs> on the pogo stick. Yeah, you'll be a very sad middle aged man, wouldn't you? Ten thousand <laughs> hours on a pogo yes. stick. But come on, yes. that's what that's what life is all about. So talking about Guinness Book of Records, though, if, do you ever sort of look through the records? Because my favourite stat basically on Guinness Book of Records because most of them we kind of think okay Usain Bolt's the world's fastest man and going up into space all these amazing kind of records but some of the records in that book are rubbish they're just kind of beyond rubbish and you kind of think how did somebody not beat that my favorite stat and I'm going to ask you this question is how many Jaffa cakes can you eat in a minute and be classed a Guinness Book of Records holder Oh my gosh! Well, so one, what is a japper cake? A jaffa cake, sort of like jaffer. A, yeah, like is that a, it? yeah, yeah, like a jaffa, like a biscuit with an orange in the middle. Do you not have jaffa cakes out there? Oh, we don't. It's almost oh, so it's almost like a Danish, like a donut with a fruit center of some sort. It's kind of like a soggy Oreo with kind of a very oh, wow. sort of soft top, but inside it's jelly and it's orange jelly. So you can kind of bite the top off. Wow take the orange bit out like a kind of little little disc you could eat that and you can eat the bottom bit as well and they, they're called cakes we have them in the united kingdom all the time i i thought the world was wow. full of jaffa cakes 
I hope you're Googling no, yourself at I've, the moment. I, the closest thing, yeah, the closest thing we probably have is is maybe a jelly-filled donut or a, uh, like I said, a cheese, not a cheese Danish, a, a, a Danish that has, uh, you know, fruit filling, that, but it, there's no top on it. It's It's open-faced in a way, so... Well, we, you, um, you Google it. You're, you're near a computer, I assume. Okay. Go yes. and you Google it. We're, we're just kill time for a moment because this is okay. a this is a big part of this show. This is what makes this show award winning. <laughs> right. Let's see. Oh, so it's it. Oh, okay. I believe I've never seen one in person, but I have seen this uh, online before. That's interesting. Yeah, it does look like it looks like an Oreo. It does. It kind of looks like an but Oreo kinda, with stuff inside. Yeah. So, so yeah, what, what do you reckon? That's... Looking at that, and they're sort of Oreo size. How many? This is the biggest build-up this question's ever had. How many do you reckon right. to be a Guinness Book of Records world holder? Oh gosh, um, I'm I'm gonna go with let's seventy-five. Seven. If you go hit seven at uh, last count, you would have smashed the records. Seven. Seven of those in a minute. Seven only? Yes. Oh, in a minute. Oh, okay. That's way different. Um, yeah, you're right. I would have guessed probably about ten, but yeah, seven. Wow. Yeah, seven. So see, you can you could be a double world record holder. You could be the pogo stick champ and also a Jaffa cake eater. And if you could do it at the same time, then that's even a bigger record. You'll end up on the Tonight Show or something like that. It will yes. be it will be glory. Stupid human tricks. Glory yes. all the way. Right, so let's let's cut to the actual chase now and, and let's get on with the productivity because basically I pulled you away from being productive there and I made you waste <laughs> some of your time, which kind of is is what I like to do. I like to twist slightly. But how did it all come about? How did you become the master of the beyond the to-do list? Because I, I like the phrase that, because that is something that we all struggle with on a daily basis anyway. We haven't got enough time, or we think we haven't got enough time, but you've kind of flipped it on its head and you're proving on a daily basis that you have got enough time. Yeah, and, and I would say that the, the reason anybody ever gets good at anything, unless it's a natural talent and they just start practicing and, and really just hitting that groove with that, is by failing at it for a very long time beforehand and then deciding to change. And that's exactly what I did is, you know, along the way, I, I mean, I, th this will come out later, but uh, I hated doing schoolwork. I hated being in school. I hated, um, you know, having to do any type of work that was not enjoyable. So the key was to find the work that was enjoyable. But even then, work can be you, you don't want work you it's one of those things where everybody's always like, find your passion. And then once you find your passion, <laughs> It won't feel like work anymore. And I'm like, yeah, that's really only the key to not making it feel like drudgery sometimes. Hard work is still hard work and hard work still drains your energy and makes you feel tired. Don't don't kid yourself. That's I mean, you and good, you know, the good work that you can do and if you find it and, and you connect it with your passion and all that stuff, it will refresh you as well and you'll feel validated and, you know, and, and the, the dots will join up, etc. But um, yeah, you still, you still have to figure out how to function efficiently and effectively. And, and in essence, that's where I struggled for a long time until I started to investigate and learn, you know, these tips and tricks and hacks and tools and things to, you know, basically build that structure that scaffolding that system up to support myself so then i could be more flexible again and more creative and artistic etc so that's that's how it that's how it came about in a nutshell so so how bad were you <laughs> well i mean there there were months and months where i didn't do homework at all in school and did they not tell you did the teachers not tell you or your mum and dad say oh they told you me. haven't had homework for months now what's going on I mean, that's that's essentially it. Like the teachers would say, oh, you don't have your homework. And, and my parents, you know, specifically my dad would say, you don't have your homework. You haven't done your homework. And, it's, and it, it just didn't I didn't care. It didn't matter to me. It wasn't, you know, and it, and, it, and the thing was, was that it, it I know now that I could have done it and I could have structured, you know, uh, the, the evening time better after I got out of class and, and school and got home and you know, re refreshed with a snack and some television and, you know, play outside or mow the lawn or something for money. That would have been great. But uh, yeah, I just didn't. <laughs> it was not my interest. 
<laughs> you like to lay on the sofa with a pogo stick and some Jaffa cakes, and that was bliss, wasn't there it? There you go. Yes, yes, it was. We've drawn so, you back. So yeah, and yeah, and and even later on, like only in uh, only in college did I start to have some of the you know systems and things click into place where finally uh, it was a, a manageable. Uh, I knew where I was going, I knew, or at least I thought I did, and so moving in a direction helped. Um, and even then, after graduating and moving on and changing different styles of jobs over a few different years and, and work styles shifted, and each time it was very much a, oh, this now works completely different. Need to set up a whole different system. Okay, good. Well, here we go. So so let's give our audience a steer just so that we can get a sort of a time zone here, a timeline on, on it. How, how old are you now, Eric, if you don't mind me asking? I am 36 years old. Okay, so you're 36. You're, you've been married for how many years? 12. Oh, you answered that really quickly. That was, that was good. So, and so there was well, a... it's because my anniversary is next weekend, so I am very aware. <laughs> you would be a bad man, wouldn't you, if you'd forgotten yes. that? Yes, but I of would. course, we record this live, you realise, and so it is the 17th of September. So it's, yes. it's gone wrong. It's gone wrong. You've missed it. So now it's been 12 years and a month. Yes. Or more. Once again, twisting with your brain. So you're, you're that age. When, when were the systems starting to come in? And did you see somebody that just seemed to have it down pat and you kind of saw them and go, why is he just floating around? Why has he got all the beautiful women on his arm and I'm just running around stressed <laughs> because I haven't managed to get my homework done? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think there was probably a few a few uh, friends in college who seemed to not struggle. I mean, they would still get have all that time, the same time I did, or more, without stress. That is even to to do the fun things and not be stressed out, and they wouldn't be worried about tests. They'd you know they'd studied, they'd put that time in, they'd done their assignments, they'd attended all their classes, they were working, they had their relationships, guy friends, girlfriends, etc., and it was all great. And I didn't have all that together. It just didn't seem to be in place. So, yeah, at that point in time, and then especially after, after getting married and, and especially work, moving into working life at that point, um, and this, again, would be 10 to 15 years ago and then into marriage and, and working in, in that in the last 10 years, it's it's definitely been... Um, you know, along that time, at some point, it was realizing again, oh, it's another shift, and I don't know how to make this work with, you know, the new job and the tasks and the, the routines that needed to happen to make that work. And then getting things done kind of came along, and I, or at least I found it a couple years after it came out. And that was really kind of the first couple, you know, key, one of the first couple key pieces. So, because I, I've always been very productive, and it's just kind of in me. I've always thought to myself, and once I started studying, and we're going to talk about Parkinson's Law, because I'm sure you're an expert on it, and I, I really like it, and I, I kind of preach to my kids about Parkinson's Law. But when, once I started reading this book called The 80-20 Principle, it flipped my head. And basically, for the listeners out there, pretty much... 80% of your efforts, the good stuff that comes to you is based on 20%, sorry, 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. So if you flip it on the other side, you're wasting so much of your time doing stuff that really isn't relevant to your end product. But if you just focus on the things you want to do that will have a direct relation to your end product, then bang, you've got so much time. And I discovered this, and it was a book and it went on and on and on this book, basically telling me the same principle over and over again. It could have been a pamphlet, basically. But by the end of it, I thought, yeah, absolutely right. So I looked in my work and I thought, what do I need to do? And I wrote a list of what do I need to achieve? And I just focused on that. And suddenly my eight hour day went down to about two hours. But then that screwed me up because I started thinking, well, if I can get it done in two hours, why am I sitting here for eight hours? And I kind of become a Tim Ferriss kind of clone <laughs> that wanted to go and sit on a field somewhere or, or run around and do stuff because I've done the work you're asking me. And why do I have to be here for eight hours? You only pay me for doing that work. And my mind all went sort of funny. So I, I made the leap of faith. But um, but you kind of step through those dots as well that there was key points to your life when you went yeah i really need to get productive and i'm not only going to be productive but i'm going to demonstrate it to the world 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and that's the thing is, you know, for me, I started to realize exactly that same kind of a, a flip in my mind was, oh, you mean I only really need to do these things and it's base the job is basically done. Well, how do I do those 20% things faster or even repeated so that they're always, you know, in check and I know that they're, that they're done? I do a seven day a week show and the amount of people that go to me, ah, oh, the amount of work. And I kind of go, yes, I suppose so. But it's not that hard. Once you get the systems in place and once you sort of put it together mm-hmm. and you know when you're doing things, it's not like work really. I'm having a chat at the moment, you know. I, I'm, I'm doing something that I love doing. I'm having a chat. I'm recording it. I'm putting it out to the world. Hopefully people love it. And end of day, I, I do another one. I do another one. I do another one. And it just keeps on flicking over. So a lot of people have this kind of perception of, wow, that's a lot of work before they've even tried to do it themselves. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work to build a train and then put it on the track and then get it running. But once you've built it and once it's on the track, it's not like every single day when you do a a new show, you're (laughs) building a train. You're just getting on the train you've already built. Oh, I like that. I like that. That is why you're the master, Eric. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, so no, absolutely right. I think probably 80 percent of the effort was getting it going in the first place, trying to get guests on the show setting the the sort of network up but now it is as you say it's just moving on a little bit moving on a little bit and what i like about that analogy as well is with a train if you try to push it at the beginning it's almost impossible to get it moving but once it starts rolling it gets easier and easier and easier see i'm good as well aren't i there you go yeah the momentum starts and and then you'd need less effort to get back into it so have you got a boss at the moment eric or are you the boss I, when it comes to my podcast, I'm the boss, but in, when it comes to the contract work I'm doing currently, that I do have a boss, actually. Right. I wanted to ask you a question of how, how much of your time is focused on the end product, but if your boss is listening, I'm not going to ask that. We'll do it afterwards. But it is useful to know <laughs> that as a social um, kind of entrepreneur, when you are in the, the online environment, a lot of your work can get done at times that's not sociable for other people. And that frees you up as well, doesn't it? The fact that you can get up at four o'clock in the morning and have a chat with somebody in the United Kingdom at their time zone and vice versa. You're not restricted to what everyone else is doing at nine to five. Yeah, no, definitely. that, That whole flexibility of time and location really is helpful. When, when did you start loving it? Because it's quite obvious you do love it. And have you found your thing? Do you think this, as you say, have you found your passion, Eric? <laughs> you know what? I, I think there's still room to explore and grow and uh, fully express the, the, the things that I'm, I'm really interested in. There's there. I mean, you, for example, uh, the productivity podcast, not the first podcast that I've done for solo show. But uh, not the first podcast that I've done. I used to do a social media show that was co-hosted. I actually did a comedy show prior to this. Or what prior what to kind of, of comedy? Those, well, jokes or uh, ranting or uh, you what know, kind of person were you? Kind of, kind of ranting. Kind of, you know, it was a du- kind of a duo comedy team kind of a thing. My friend and I, we'd sit in front of our microphones and we'd just hit record. And you know, the show was called "We're Both Right," and the the idea was is we'd kind of argue, but we never went that way too much it was more oh yeah this is my opinion oh this is my opinion and then it's like oh well we're both right and uh back in 2007 we were actually at the end of the year in december itunes named us one of the top 10 new comedy podcasts way back in the day and uh that was that was fun but i miss it i miss doing (laughs) witty banter creative back and forth with people on a show so at some point here that's gonna have to come back because i miss it too much because you were ahead of the curve. You was in sort of Ricky Gervais territory back in sort of 2007, weren't you? Because there, there wasn't an awful... Now, basically, dogs and frogs have got shows. A- anything that moves <laughs> and has got a mouth seems to have a podcast. I get so many people on the show where they come to me and go, I'd like to be on the show, and I look at their thing, and their, their whole life doesn't seem to be linked to a podcast at all. But there's a podcast, and they're putting these shows out. It's amazing how it's exploded. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's funny the way that it's almost taken 10 years to get here to where we're at now. 
Uh, but podcasting has been around for actually more than that. It was 2005 was when iTunes added it to its uh, software, but it was around for another year or two before that. So, you know, 2004, 2003 even. So we've we've kind of hit the 10 plus year of it existing, but really not crossed over yet. It'll be uh, summer next summer, so summer 2005 or sorry, 2015 when iTunes will have had it. Uh, had podcasts available in the iTunes store for 10 years. That's just, it, it blows my mind it's been 10 years already. What would you say when people ask you what you do for a living? Because people keep on asking me, and certainly in the United Kingdom, no one understands what a podcast is. And my, my downloads, my downloads seem to be huge in America, which is kind of understandable. The French love me. Don't know why, but hey, they're going great guns. But in the United Kingdom, it seems to be my friends and my mum and, and people that are sort of listening to me because people don't understand the concept of a podcast. So I kind of say I'm an online radio host or I'm a kind of online talk show host, that kind of thing. What, what, how do you actually um, describe yourself? Yeah, um, you know, I, for the most part, uh, up until recently, it was very much the the other way around where the thing that I was – and I still kind of think of it this way. The thing that I spend the most amount of time on is what I say that I do, which is you know, right now I'm a community manager for social media examiner. Um, but up until recently, you know, about four months ago, a little more – Actually, five months by the time this is out, that I, you know, I used to do, I used to do day, uh, my day job was social media, so that's kind of where I would start off with. But uh, then some people they would not know me from that; they would only know me from the podcast. So I, I, I still would say, hey, I do a podcast, and if they didn't know what that was, I would say, well, it's an online radio show, and I would leave it at that. They would, they would understand. I think to a certain point, you know, they, <laughs> the, the technology has still not fully, even though we've got you know, uh, super powered computers in our pocket, always on us. <laughs> we don't understand that the, and, and, and Wi-Fi everywhere, I guess, whether it's in actual Wi-Fi or it's uh, cell tower capability, we've got access to everything and processing power beyond what we can comprehend on us at all times. But we don't understand that you can listen to something <laughs> through uh, a device in your pocket, even though Walkmans have been around for forever. I guess they're not around now, but they used to be. You, you know what I mean? You still call it so, a Walkman because I do to my kids. And I go, it's not. I do. It's an I, MP3 player. I go, oh, no, it's a Walkman. Oh, no, I don't call. I mean, I, I call it iPod now, but. Uh, oh, you're back so in cutting the day, edge, Eric. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, I used to have. I had the literal Walkman. I would call then the, the, the predecessor of that the, the CD player that would play the compact discs, and uh, especially when they. It established the it would read ahead by about five to ten seconds so if you were moving around a bit it wouldn't skip uh, while reading the disc and then yeah mp3 players i didn't really ha i had one mp3 player at one point but then i moved into the ipod for sure and since then it's ever it's always been ipod the most stupid one i remember was the vinyl walkman which for, for sort of youngsters, you won't remember this, but there were the things called records and they were like big black things with a hole in the middle, a bit like a sort of extended CD. And it, as I'm doing this, Eric, this is another Google opportunity for you. Type in a vinyl Walkman <laughs> and you will see the picture of this thing. And it's like a huge stapler that you basically hung a record in and the record would spin round as you walked and you could actually listen to it as you were going. Now, that is one of those devices that you think, really, why did that not take on? Being able to walk around with something that could easily get scratched or dirty, swinging by your leg. Have, have, have you or ever broke. seen one of those? Man. I have never I did not know that a vinyl Walkman ever existed. That is insane in my mind. It's beyond insane. You see, this is why you've come on this show, Eric. As I said at the beginning, I will take you into areas that you've never thought possible. And <laughs> you will be now be sitting in a pub with your mates and you will be going, Do you know how many Jaffa cakes you can eat in a minute and be a Guinness Book of Record? And you'll be talking about vinyl Walkmans and pogo sticks and stuff. Nothing about the conversation that I'm meant to have. <laughs> That would be just gone from your mind. And they say, what did that English bloke talk to you about? And you go, oh, I can't remember. But I do remember these stupid things. But yeah, vinyl <laughs> Walkman. Um, all our listeners out there will be now sort of secretly listening to this at work while trying to sort of Google these things. Oh, and they'll be good. Yeah, there's Googling happening right now. Trust me. 
But I, I actually had tried to buy a record player a few years ago because I realised I had a lot of these records and I went into a shop. They had no idea and I actually had to say to them, it's a black thing with a hole in the middle that spins round. Absolutely no idea. And that's only kind of 10 years ago. It's amazing how technology has moved to where we are now, basically creating content on the podcast, which kind of just goes out into space and nobody really owns it but it's hugely valuable especially if you get a podcast that is rocking and rolling and is getting huge downloads you know it's life-changing isn't it but nobody actually owns the thing itself amazing yeah no not at all did you people understand what you're doing though with the podcast and stuff you know do people say yeah but how are you going to make money from it how 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 is it a business yeah, I think so. I mean, in one sense, they understand that the more people that listen then is appealing to people who would sponsor or buy ad space in the show. That's one way. The other is just when people know you from something that they listen to that you do over time, they trust you. And then if you have something that's beneficial to them, they'll pay you for it. That's just it's simple, like, you know, with my book that I co-wrote with my friend and you know, people have bought it and that's paid some bills. So that's been nice, you know? So, and, and I wouldn't think that it's, it's not just the whole being an online quote unquote celebrity. It's being helpful and, and being uh, available and, and really listening to what people need and then giving them that. And then because of that, they're willing to pay. So, yeah, I mean, not everybody. I mean, that's the kind of thing is not everybody knows I have a book out there. Not everybody knows I even have a podcast, but those that do understand it to a certain extent. And, and the, the, the gap between those two is, is, uh, is not widening the opposite of widening. It's thinning. So, so, so how, how do you actually group all those things together? You know, one of the things that we, we talk about on a daily basis is the leap of faith. And, have you had that leap of faith? Because all our listeners are out there and they're doing jobs and they're not keen on it or they're in relationships and they're not keen on it and they, they haven't got that oomph to actually do something about it. Did you just naturally transition or was there a time in your life that you can look back on and go, yeah, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I am now. What we call on the show, the big dot. Yeah, I would say that that's definitely – it was more of a subtle thing and a longer thing. And so it kind of came to fruition again recently, earlier this year, where it wasn't necessarily a planned thing. But it was very much an aware thing that sometime in the next year to two years it was going to happen. And it, it just – it became more of a hop than a leap because – the, the bridge was being built the entire time across that chasm to where when you finally got near the edge, it was just, oh, hop, you know, instead of, you know, run, 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 leap and hope to <laughs> grab the other side, you know? Because that's, that's what people think it is, though, don't they? When they're, when they're in a job and it's a rubbish job and they don't like it and they don't like Big Nelly that sits next to them and it just sort of gets them down, they do feel that they really, the only way that they can get free is pretty much telling somebody to get off, basically, and mm -hmm. then walking, yeah. walking out with no salary and no income. But what we're trying to get across on this show is as long as you plan, as long as you sort of extend things, it shouldn't be like that. You should be able to at least transition while your bills are covered. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was going to take two years to go from where I was to where I wanted to be. And it's been coming up a year now, and I'm kind of halfway there. You know, I've set the groundwork. Have, have I still got a roof over my head? Yes. Am I still paying the bills? Yes. Am I doing stuff every single day that I want to do? No. I've got certain things that I have to do. But the transition, as you say, I, I would I'd say it was more a slide, actually. I, I slid. Yeah. I didn't do it like a little hop. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. I, and that's the thing is people, you know, they feel like they're stuck in a job. That's the thing you got to do to feel unstuck is to look around you and look down and look at where you're at and say to yourself, okay, well, if this isn't where I want to be, then how, where I am now, can I start building the bridge to where I want to be? Because it's not going to be just some jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. It's it, that's just not it. You've got to, again, slide or leap or hop, whichever, you know, and you never know when the opportunity will be there to when it's right to do it, but prep for it. 
I'm going to play you a little speech now. This is by a man called Jim Carrey, and I think it says everything what we're talking about. Have a listen to this. My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. Do you think we should teach all our kids that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, even I've had some some talks with my daughter about just the fact of how much she loves doing art. And I would rather her do that than, you know, settle. So even now, it, it's how do you do what you're supposed to do? Don't do what you feel you have to do. But we all do that, don't we? We all go for oh, our we life. Do. And we leave college and we go into jobs that just pay us stuff. And is it our passion? No, but it's a good job. Yes, that's what I want. And then mm-hmm. we sort of get five years into it and we actually think, actually, the good job isn't that good because I've got used to the money now, but I don't like the hours. Yeah, and, and the thing to remember there is those jobs aren't bad per se. There are, you know, it, it is in a sense physical labor of your mind or it could be literal physical labor for that matter where you're getting paid but you're exercising whether you're, you're exercising your mind your body etc your willpower your discipline that's what that is is an opportunity to exercise those things that you'll need in order to do well the thing you really want to do because you you said that phrase at the beginning and it used to annoy me so much and i i heard it in your voice it annoyed you as well find your passion <laughs> And yes. people used to say that to me for years. Oh, when you find your passion, you will know. And I used to think, oh, I don't know what my passion is. Just tell me. Just just give me a clue. You know me better than I know myself. But then when it happens, you kind of think, oh, my God, they were right. And one of the things that we've sort of stumbled across here is that your true passions in life apparently are the things that are closely evidenced between the ages of 8 and 14. So the things that you come back and you do from school and when you should be doing your homework, you want to be drawing, you want to be running around, you want to be doing stuff, just seems to be coming out time and time again. And I've had people that say to me, yes, when I was sort of like between the ages of 18 and 14, eight and 14, I would get home and I would run around and I would pretend I was a soldier. And I'd say to him, well, what do you, what do, you do for a living? Oh, I'm, I'm in the army. Or they go, oh, I would lay on the floor and I would draw for hours. And what are you doing now? Oh, I'm a... a graphic designer or something and there seems to be that trait that we forget what we loved doing somewhere along the line so that when we get a job we just get a job and we don't really plan on what makes us come alive inside yeah i think so and i think that uh, a lot of the key elements of what i'm all about and enjoy doing and, and being even uh we're definitely from that that era, that, that eight to 14 and maybe a little even earlier and a little later. Um, but yeah, all the, the different things like the, the audio, the video, uh, even social media was communication and, and really, uh, media meets technology. Um, and then again, the things that I found out that I did like about school, even if I didn't like the homework was English class and writing class, because it was very much about, the reading of, you know, story, it was stories and it was, uh, and even acting a little bit, being part of a story or pre- playing a part. And, and even these days when I'm, I'm working in social media and marketing, marketing to me is just effective communication. It's not manipulation. It's, it's effective communication. And it's, it's all these different things mixed together. And even the acting kind of fits into, uh, my interest in comedy too. So, yeah, all those interests, though, I, I think as they've morphed into be this wider palette of things that I like to, to draw on, um, the roots of all of them, yeah, are definitely in those, you know, me playing or me making mixtapes, you know, back in, in oh, I love with my little tape. recorder, you know, I'd, I'd listen to the radio and be like, oh, here's the song. I love this song record. And, and, and then making mixtapes has that kind of morphed over where you've got the two decks and the one machine. Um, and then it mi- moved over to, you know, as, as, as the technology evolved to where you can, you could burn uh, CDs and uh, and then playlists and obviously then to the iPod and and even with video, it was very much recording VHS tapes off 
the television and then um, moving towards the nonlinear editing that iMovie and Final Cut Pro became, you know, all about. I, I, I say that if I knew podcasting and YouTube would be coming down the pipeline, I would have prepared for them. But and I, I almost kind of was in a sense. <laughs> so, well, well, you did because no experience is wasted. All the things that you were doing that was playing right. just makes you aware of the possibilities, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. And and that's the thing is now I'm aware of the possibilities. Back then I didn't I had no clue. There was no the the things that I'm doing right now as a job uh, did not exist five, ten years ago. And now they do. And I could not have imagined that. So how do you prepare for that? By preparing yourself, by learning how to do what you love well, and then you adapt that to the technology as it becomes available. Because I, I had an amazing thing. I was a financial trainer and I used to do training courses um, for this insurance company. And it, there was only me doing it. And it was all right at the very beginning when the company was quite small, but it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And suddenly there was, you know, a few hundred people and only me. So if I was training to 30 people, there was 170 people that needed training and I couldn't do it. And so I just said, look, I'm going to make these little videos and I would record myself and then people can listen to them at their desk with their headphones. That's your training. And I look back on it now and I thought I was just creating a podcast and I didn't realize it was. So when I actually started doing this, a lot of the skills that I needed to actually sort of make sure that the audio quality and all that kind of stuff was good, I already knew. Yes, I had to put it together and I knew, you know, how to upload it onto Libsyn and all those kind of techie things that no one else is interested, but you'll understand. But the, the nuts and bolts of it, I kind of already knew just because I'd been trying things and then pulled it together. So, yeah, no experience is wasted. It doesn't matter if you're in a rubbish job or a rubbish relationship or whatever. You can get some nuggets of gold from all of them, can't you, Eric? Totally. Yeah. That, and that's the thing that I've you know learned up, up until this point. And in fact, that's the whole thing is you don't like the whole Steve Jobs connect the dots thing is you don't know. You can't see it's hindsight is is twenty twenty. You don't look forward and know for sure. You don't have certainty. But unless you have, you know, faith or whatever he says that you uh, that it's going to connect. And, and I think that's the thing is if you realize for the most part, the people that look forward and assume it will connect, prepare for it to connect and then they're available and, and ready and willing and able when it does connect and it, and that's kind of why it does you know yeah absolutely let's let's bring on steve because i think you you've built him up quite well he's waiting in the wings <laughs> this is steve jobs of course it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when i was in college but it was very very clear looking backwards 10 years later again you can't connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking backwards so you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future you have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Why do you think those words are so powerful? And I've only ever had one person in 150 shows who actually said, I would like to punch him in the face for saying that. And uh, he, he came back with a, a quite a quite an okay theory why he wanted to and he almost swung me but he didn't he didn't swing me but everybody else says yeah i totally agree with that and it, it's like words of the ages they're going to be there forever in a day aren't they yeah and the reason that i mean here's the thing i wouldn't argue against it because i've heard it a couple of different times and for me the reason that it rings true is because it does it resonates with my quote-unquote journey my story my path, uh, all these different words, I guess, just my experience, there you go. My experience has been that it's true because looking forward from back then, I didn't know. But looking back from where I am, I can see the dots connect. But that's the same for everyone, isn't it? But And, and this is really, I don't think I've ever said this on any show, but I'm going to say it now. We say that because we have made it happen. And the people who are in you know, situations that they don't like, they've got to start doing something. Otherwise, they haven't got any dots to look back and join up. That might sound a bit harsh, but then at the mm. end of the day, they will sit there and go, ah, those words weren't true. And I can go to them, 
It's only true because you didn't make them true. You actually had to get off your backside. You had to turn off Netflix and you actually had to try to start doing something. And it doesn't matter if it happens overnight. Hopefully it doesn't happen overnight. Hopefully you, you plan and you progress like Eric says. So it's a gentle slide to your dream life. But I would be totally wrong if I wasn't saying the words now that you all out there can have the best life you possibly can have or at the worst, much, much better than you're getting at the moment. But you do need to take that first step and start wanting it. And that is what Eric's done. That's what I've done. And we're not all successful. We're all in that sort of transition. We're all striving on to more things. But we are making those dots that we can look back and go, yes, we've got there. Is that a bit harsh, Eric? I don't think it's harsh. I think that uh, in effect, if you want to make it softer or easier to digest, don't think of it as dots. Think of it as two dots, the where you are and, and the the one next step forward where you want to go. There will be other dots further down. There have already been dots further back. And so in essence, <laughs> maybe turn around and look where dots have already connected that you haven't been aware of. And don't look at all the forward dots that you need to connect moving forward. Just look at the one in front of you. I'm, I'm going to tell you something that happened to me the other day, Eric, and it, it was to do with you. So this, this is going to be bigging you up. I was sitting here preparing for the show and I like to do a certain amount of online stalking. And I went on your site and you have got a range of podcasts, as I say, who hasn't. And there was one of them. I can't remember the title of it, but it pretty much said, you know, a lot of you are going to hate this podcast. Um, so if you don't like it because it's just me in a car driving along talking, <laughs> then just turn it off now. And just because you phrased it like that made me grab attention. And I sort of thought, this is the one I want to listen to more than anything else. And at the beginning, you're talking about the flavor of the show. But you actually said, I've listened back to this and I actually got sense out of it, which I didn't realize I was saying at the time. You actually were kind of joining up your own dots because you were just speaking, it was coming out of your head, but it wasn't until you looked back and you reflected, which I suppose this show is all about, that you actually went, oh yeah, I can actually see that. I didn't know what I was saying at the time, but you gave yourself that opportunity to look back, and because you did that, you've now stepped forward. It was, it was, it was, I loved that show. I liked it because you could hear the ground moving where you were driving in the car, and I just got a vibe of it was just you speaking into a, a handheld with a little mic or whatever you were doing. But it was just you talking, and it was coming from the heart, and it was in your head. Yeah, that, that, honestly, that one, for me, regardless of it being a podcast or not, that experience of walking through those talking out loud thoughts and then listening back through it again and to, you know, do show notes and everything. It really, it was an experience of reflection slash audio journaling. Uh, and it was honestly, it was very much digging. It was almost like I was digging the dots up out of the dirt in my mind. And then once they were in front of me, I could start to look back, look at them and study them a little bit and draw connections to them to each other. So yeah, it, 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 honestly, that's another thing I would suggest to people is if you, you feel like you're stuck on the dot you're on, then start journaling, you know, become more aware, have more awareness of your thoughts, your feelings, etc. Because that's one of the things where people, you know, again, this whole realm of find your passion, but don't look at it that way. Just look at it as knowing yourself better. If, if you have to go that route. I, I love the way you say that. It, it really it winds you up, doesn't it? Because it it does wind me up. <laughs> it does. I I've just heard it too many times. It's not it's not false. It's just trite because people say it too much. But that doesn't make it untrue either. I just the 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 packaging I guess is off for me now. I I really got to the point when I was probably about in my twenties that I could have punched the next person who said that to me because it was just one of those things I remember desperately wanting to move on in my life but just couldn't see what I needed to do and I think that's one of the things that you know and we need to emphasize when it's right you kind of know it's right you know when you realize that yes I can't take this job anymore I'm going to jump and I'm going to sort it out before I fall then it's right but you can't look at anyone and go god I should have been doing this I've had conversations with these 
kids. I've, yeah, they're not really kids. They're 14 years old, so they're kids in age. But the things that they have done is amazing. And I think to myself, I was 44 before I did anything. You've got 30 years on me. And I find that hugely positive that the kids nowadays have got these opportunities that we never had. They've got the internet that we never had. They've got the ability to type in how to and learn stuff instantly where you were probably the same as me. And when you got homework, well, you didn't do your homework. You, you weren't the same as me at all. Um, I used to have to cycle down to the library and look up books and actually write it out longhand. And now it's, it's very much instant and you've got tuition all around you. But you've got to start wanting it. You've got to be aware. You've got to look in the right directions, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. And, and and that's the thing is like, <laughs> in it as time went on later, I was spending my time, you know, looking books up and uh, the, the internet still wasn't too easy to to access, but I was using, you know, rudimentary forms of it and starting to dive down rabbit, you know, rabbit holes of interest at that point. It's when I was able to soak up tons of different music and watch all the different films that I hadn't watched up till that point. And, you know, public library is, is still a, a huge benefit to a lot of people and, and to myself. It is, isn't it? It's, it's, I haven't been in one for a few years, I suppose, because I just haven't been given much homework recently. But um, if I, <laughs> if I did, and I probably wouldn't do it, Eric. Now I'm at that age, I would just throw it back at them. But if, if I did, I, I'd still think that's a good place to go because you go, you're away from the distractions. You haven't got Facebook and stuff pulling you away. You've just got the content in front of you. And it is a kind of separating yourself from all those distractions, becoming more productive because you put yourself in an environment to become productive. Yeah, that's true. Because when, when all the different things, whether it's, audio, video, text, etc., come through screens, it can, because anything can come through there, it all comes through there. So yeah, it, it does actually, it, it, it helps to not just go to a library, but to also pick something up off of a shelf, put it down in front of you, and even sit at one of the tables where it's got like the, it's almost like a, a, a small version of a cubicle so that there's even blinders up on the left and right and front sides of it to where it's just you and it's just the thing and you just sit and you be where you are now you know did you use readability i yeah i i have i've actually been using a different tool these days called pocket which kind of does the same thing for, for all the listeners out there, I used to struggle that I wanted to read something and things would be flashing all over the, the screen, mm -hmm. little adverts and all that kind of stuff. And my attention was just all over the place. And you can get these these apps now and you can get these little programs on the, on the web that will, you, I don't know how they work, but basically they click and they strip down all the words and just almost turn it into a text page. And you can save it till later. So when you decide to read it, there's nothing going on other than the text that you want to learn. And that was a big wake up for me, really. When I, when I discovered that, I realized that I could actually not train my focus. I could create the environment around me to give me more focus. And then my productivity increased again. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's one of the, the, the things that in the past few months or so or more has been in change of environment and even changes of environment ongoing, you know, whether I'm working at a coffee shop or I'm working here in my bedroom office desk <laughs> with talking with you is where I am right now, what's the best setup audio wise, visual wise, et cetera, even ergonomics with, you know, how I'm sitting, <laughs> how are the best ways I can position my mind, my body, my attention to the work that I have set out to do at that time so that I'm giving it the focus it needs to be completed, you know, or at least move forward. Yeah, I've, I've got my own office at the back of my garden. At the beginning of the intro, it says live from the back of his garden in the UK. And I have, I've got like a recording studio and I just pull down all the blinds. And so there's nothing going on other than what I'm doing. And I can crack through hours 
hours upon hours upon hours. Fortunately, I love doing it. So even when I'm not doing it, I, I like to run up the 15 seconds up the garden to be able to do that. But absolutely, as you say, you create your environment to allow you to do the work that you need to do because once it's finished, you can then walk away, lock the door behind it, and then you've got free life. Trouble with being an entrepreneur is you suddenly develop that passion for it and you don't want to stop doing it. And I've never had a job like this where really I I just want to do it all the time. And I know that I've got to spend time with my family. I've got to watch films. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. But actually speaking to Eric Fisher every day, who would want more? (laughs) <laughs> yeah well i'm honored <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> so eric it would be totally wrong of me to let you go without you expanding and telling our listeners about the wonderful law that is parkinson's law first of all is it a law or is it just something that people say because it sounds more official well like with murphy's law who knows but uh if you're looking for things to go wrong murphy's law definitely exists i would say that ultimately Time and time versus tasks is what Parkinson's law is talking about, where essentially time is fixed, but the task could actually be done longer or it could take longer to do. It'll expand into the time allotted. Or if you compress that time, the task can be done much quicker. So what we're saying is really, if you give yourself six weeks to do your school homework, it's going to take six weeks. But if your parents say, we're off to Disneyland, and if you don't get that done within an hour, you're not coming, you'd still get it done. Yeah, and even if you give yourself six weeks, you won't sit there for six weeks doing it. You'll spend the entire six weeks other than five, ten minutes, or even a half hour, and you'll sit and do it then. And the quality will be less because you're not in a zone, you're not focused. And so it's just a mm-hmm. bad thing to do, isn't it? What, what we should all do is, as I try to do, I set a clock. And I set a clock and it, it ticks down, ticks down, ticks down. So I set all tasks a time. And once I stumbled across this, and it was, a, it was a simple thing to do, and I don't know why it took me so many years to do it. But once I set a clock and I thought, how long is this task going to take me? Normally take me two hours. Let's see if I can do it in half hour. More often than not, I would say 100% of the time, I get it done in half hour. And when I look back on it, because there's a kind of mild panic running through me, the quality is as good or better than the two hours. The only problem with that then, if you're in corporate land, what do you fill the rest of your time up with? That's the question there, yeah. Are they paying you for the work or are they paying you to sit there? That is where we need to get Tim Ferriss on the phone. Somebody send up the Ferriss signal and see if we can get him in. Because um, that is the problem, isn't it, with so many people? You know, it's, it's all right as an entrepreneur. You can get the work done and then you can swan off and do what you want. But in corporate land, you are responsible for being there. And I remember going back onto his book again. I remember distinctly having the realization of going, yes, he's saying, why is somebody in Bora Bora told to work nine to five? And that their work fits exactly eight hours. And my work in London fits eight hours. Who's come up with this? Who's come up with this eight hour day? It's just lunacy. Surely it should be done on the amount of work you do or the the value of work you're providing, not that you're there for eight hours. Fundamental flaw, but I don't think we're ever going to get around that. Yeah, heck, we've got people who work more than the 40 hours a week. So I think we actually go the opposite direction sometimes, too. Absolutely. Well, this is the end of the show, Eric. It's been an absolute delight speaking to you. And um, this is the bit we call the Sermon on the Mic. And we're going to send you back in time like a young Marty McFly. And if you could go back in time and speak to the young Eric, what age would you choose and what advice would you give? So strap yourself in. You're going to hit 88 miles an hour. And this is the Sermon on the Mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show. The sermon on the mic. The sermon on the mic. Hello there. This is Eric Fisher, and I'm talking to you, Eric Fisher. It sounds like I'm talking on a podcast. You don't even know what that is. You will. Trust me. See, I don't look that different, but at the same time, I do. I don't have hair, (laughs) but I have hair. It's all all migrated down to the beard, so it's a compliment. Trust me. Anyway, keep in mind 
here's the thing. I, I know that you feel bad. I know that you feel bad about, you know, being in early high school and still not feeling disciplined or able to, you know, do what you're supposed to do, but you want to do all the things that you want to do. Well, in the future, you will be able to do all those things that you want to do. You'll be able to, if I told you <laughs> someday in the future, you'll be able to do something that has to do with books and has to do with reading and writing and enjoying to do that as well as recording audio and doing mixtapes and video and doing, um, you know, recording VHS tapes and even te all the technology and video games that it could all be wrapped up into kind of one big package and you could get paid to do it. If you knew that that was even a possibility now, you would be able to uh, do the thing that some people say, which is just to buck up and, and do it. Well, here's the thing. If you know you can look forward and you get to do all those things in the future, then it will be bearable to do the things you need to do now to make it easier on yourself later. So that's the best I can give you is sit down and figure out how to be disciplined, journal, and don't forget to do those fun things. But do some of those things that you have to do and keep doing the things that you want to do and it's going to work out fine. How can our audience connect with you? You can connect with me on twitter.com slash Eric with a K, the letter J, F-I-S-H-E-R. Same goes for Facebook. And my show is beyondthetodolist.com. And if I ever get this show rocking and rolling to the point that we take it live into stadiums, will you be there to be on a pogo stick eating Jaffa cakes and breaking world records for me? I will be there and I will break that record. That's what we want and we'll get it on YouTube. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today joining up those dots. And please come back again when you have more dots to join up because I do believe that by joining up those dots and connecting our past is the best way to build our futures. Eric Fisher, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free. And we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.